Today I'm titling the message, Love and Its Maturity in You. Specifically, this is God's love. God's love, if you would, maturing in the believer. You know, in order to save some money years ago, there was a, uh, well, it was a college that had a tight budget, so they, they were putting on a play. They only bought a few scripts, though, for the play, because they didn't have enough money to buy a script for everyone in the play. So the director had this brilliant idea of cutting up the script and handing out the pieces of the script all numbered to the entire cast. Well, everybody memorized their part, but they couldn't say it with the inflections they were supposed to. It didn't make sense. Why? Well, the director said after an hour of absolute chaos, trying to practice this play, he's like, okay, everybody, sit down. I'm going to read to you the whole play. He read the play, and at the end of the play, one of the actors said, oh, so that's what it's all about. <laughs> You know, if you don't know the whole story, you can be left in the dark. And today, if you would, the love of God is something that we see on full display at the cross when Jesus died for us. When he came into this world as the Son of God incarnate, he came in flesh to love us, but more than love us. To die in our place and be raised again to complete our salvation and when we think about the joy of what Jesus provided for us, God's like, I want you to realize I don't want you to just be spectators about my love. I want you to live it out. I want it to change your life, um, to thoroughly change you. You know, the great fact is God does something in us the moment we're saved. And he wants us to be participants in the drama of the Christian life for his name's sake and his glory. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, if you're not there, beginning in verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed, believed that the love that God has for us God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Let's pray. Lord God, um, in theory, we, 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 we think we're pretty loving. Um, in theory... We like people, we love people, we perceive that we're loving, yet you want to bring this a little deeper, a little more far-reaching. You want us, Lord, to truly love everyone, no one excluded. God, help us to be ones who are not hating, snubbing, unforgiving, bitter, and the like, Lord. Would you please help us to be ones who are peaceable, loving, and proactive like your son. Lord, we're going to need your help because every one of us have areas of annoyances and irritations that we kind of dig in and we don't want to let down sometimes. Lord, would you please help us each one to grow in love. Help me, Father, to grow in love for those around me that have that selfless, sacrificial love for the highest good of those around me. May you be praised, loved, and adored in Jesus' name. Amen. 
uh, today as we come into our passage. Uh, you know, with God's love, I need to ask the question, how should the whole script of God's love, well, what is it supposed to accomplish in us? Well, the answer I believe that you could deduct from this passage is this. Christian, are you maturing in God's love to bring God's desired outcome for you? You see, God wants, if, you know, if you guys have ever played with electricity and you're, you go to turn on a switch that you just wired, you're, you just say you replaced your outlet and it doesn't work. You're like, oh man. And you pull it off and you see that the little wire on the positive or the negative slipped off. So it wasn't connecting. You're like, that's where it went wrong. You know what God is trying to get through to us? He's like, I want my love to come full circuit through you. I don't want my love to just be a, a stagnant, imaginary thing. This is the problem. We usually measure our love by our good intentions. Well, I intended to love. I must be loving. This is Mr. Love right here. And, you're, and yet God's like, uh, 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 I don't think so. I want it to really come full circle, full circuit. My love flowing through you. I want it to really be true love. And as last week, and you can go on YouTube to see that message if you'd like, we see that love, agape love, is us, if you would, having a unselfish, sacrificial love for the highest good of another. Those are key elements to true biblical love. And as we studied last week, love is not sloppy. It doesn't enable sin, but it is always for their highest good, their best. And it's always selfless. Because if you leave self in, it's about you. And we need to be ones that are truly about God's business of loving like Jesus loves. Well, uh, God wants us, if you would, verse 12, look there, verse 12, uh, zero back in on it. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. The word perfected is what Jesus yelled from the cross. It's a similar word, to telestai. This is a, a slightly different form of it, but basically it is finished. It is completed. It's brought to maturity. God's like, I want your love to come to its full intended purpose. I want your love to, if you would, accomplish my good ends in you. And what is God's good ends? I want my love, God says, reproduced in you, in your love, your attitudes, your actions, your purposes. God's like, I really want it lived out in you. Perfected is a reoccurring word that is coming up in the book of 1 John. It comes up in 2.5 comes up in verse 12, and then we're going to study a little bit later. We see verse 17 and 18. We see that the love of God is uh, to be perfecting us. Verse 12, verse 17, the love has been perfected among us. Verse 18, and we see, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. It's like if you're walking around scared, anxious, worrying all the time, it's like you will never be able to to have a mature love. Your love cannot be brought to the place of maturity as long as you're anxious, worried, fearful. You know, we often think the opposite of love is hate. The opposite of love is fear. It's all about, you know why? We fear losing things. Fear the loss of a girlfriend or a boyfriend, a fear of a loss of our apartment or our income or our hours. Or, it's always a loss. We fear what others think. We, are, we get wrapped up in loss. What does love do? Love gives. If you're about fear, you're about getting. If you're about love, you're about giving. Do you see how that they're diametrically opposed to each other? Perfect love casts out fear. Or may I put it in reverse? If you do not allow perfect love to cast out your fear, your fears will cast out your love. You cannot love as long as you're suspicious. And that's a major problem. And we're all like swallowing hard right about now. We're like, man, 
Uh, that that kind of explains some problems. That's how things do go awry. But I, we need to get back to verse 12. Verse 12, God wants the love of God to be perfected in us. That is, matured. It wants to be completed, to be brought full orb, if you would, in our lives. God's love reaches its intended goal when his love is reproduced in our actions, our attitudes, and the like. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, that makes sense, that we should have a maturing love. I get that. But did you see the beginning of that verse, Pastor? Verse, verse 12 says that no one's ever seen God at any time. What does that have to do with love? You could be having a big old question mark like the invisible God and in love. Don't get it. Ah, you know why? No one's ever seen God, but the closest they get to seeing God is whether you're going to love like God. If you would, you get to manifest the immense love of Jesus if you show that love. Oh, I think Jesus said something. They'll know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Oh, do you remember Jesus saying that? He's like, hey, you, if you're going to, if you really want to make a difference in the world, my love has really got to be a transformative, selfless, self-denying power, if you would, in your lives. A factor, a value, um, a goal that you have and the aim of your life. Well, Verse 12, we, he brings out the invisibility of God. He says, Jesus abides in you. The word abides comes up six times. Your translation might have the word remains, resides. Um, it catches some of the same idea. Um, I like abides, New King James and King James. Uh, a lot, and one of them had resides. He he dwells and resides in you. The, all those words kind of catch the Greek word here, so that you display a correct view of God. You love like Him. Now, when you don't love like Jesus, what do you display to the world? A distorted view of Christ. You're a Christ. If you are a Christian, now Christian doesn't mean you go to church. Doesn't mean you put money in the plate. It doesn't mean that your culture, religion says do, do, do. True Christianity is, says done. Jesus paid it all. All you've got to do is believe what and bank on what he did and say, I am trusting fully his death to take care of my sin problem, my offenses before a holy God. It's not, not suits and ties or any of that frills and stuff like that. It's all about Jesus. You know, one person, I think it was Edgar Guest that coined this term, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Um, the world really would like to see love lived out in us. When we live sacrificially, selflessly, the world says, oh, that's different. You ever love someone and it's just like kind of a shock? Like, you wish that it wasn't so shocking that, I mean, like, I hope that was a little more natural than just like a one-time occurrence. But you, the world sometimes is just amazed that we can love without a cost or payback. And that's what God wants us to be doing. You know, I want to mention, though, when it says perfected or maturity, we need to realize that spiritual maturity is not based on your age. There are some Christians who were saved in the 1940s and 50s who are still babes in Christ. They, they didn't grow like they needed to. And that could be you. Just because you have sat in a church for 30, 40, 50 years doesn't mean that you're mature. Now, you may have been there quite mature at one time, but you've drifted. You, you've lost your first love. You've allowed distractions to displace the right values. Well, as we think about that, I want to challenge us. Beware, oh, our first point, maturing in God's love, number one, selflessly displays love for one another. Selflessly displays love for one another and evidences God's wrath residing, uh, that was a typo, Res God's residing in you, verse 12. I want us to also think on this for application. Beware of using the excuse, I'm just too shy and not uh, outgoing enough. 
how much of the time do we say, I can't love them? I, you don't understand, Pastor. I'm just kind of a homebody. I don't, I don't talk with people. This is my shell. I don't get into other people's bubble. Um, I, I'm very Western in my thinking. Uh, that, that's their territory. This is mine. We don't cross paths. Um, is that what Jesus, though, has called us to? Not excuses, but proactive love. Now, real love that's sacrificial is not invasive in the sense of obnoxious, but it is proactive. And we have to think, how do I be proactive in loving others? Well, to love is not, uh, to love is not a command to only extroverts. God will give strength to obey the imperative to love one another. This is what we call a horatory command in the verse 12. Let us love one another. He's like, you need to be doing this, sacrificially loving one another. We need to pray, think, and act on ways that you can love others. Love is a voluntary, sacrificial, and caring commitment to seek the highest good of another, as I already mentioned in the definition of love. Well, as we consider those things, we need to ask... And uh, verses 13 and through 15, just a moment, we see maturing in God's love evidences God's testimony that you're born again. You see, the book of 1 John wants you to have assurance that you're saved. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. He says in chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, we come in our pas passage of chapter 12, 4, and we look in verse 13. Let's look there again. It says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides, He remains, He resides in Him. And he and him, he and God, sorry. Uh, so as we look in this passage, we see these things should be known by you. The, the Greek word gnosko, to experientially know. He wants you to really know this in your life, that you confess Jesus. I know Jesus as my Savior. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're right with God, that you know Jesus as your Savior? as the Lord God, who is your only hope of heaven. You see, we live in a world that's used to checking boxes. I like Jesus. I like this advertiser. You see it in YouTube all the time. What comes up? Do you like these brands? Check, check, check or not. You know, we're so used to boxes that you could like Jesus but never go to heaven because liking Jesus doesn't save you. Knowing Jesus saves you. Knowing him on his terms and uh, believing by faith alone in Christ alone. Well, as we think about this, we know we abide in Christ because of the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it says <clears throat> in verse 14, uh, we see, let's see, verse 14, we have seen. The word seen there is to behold, to gaze at, and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. John's like the apostolic, we, we saw him. Remember, Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses at once. He was handled, he was seen for 40 days. And so that, that was kind of where we're at. Now verse 15 Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. This is good news. And as we see throughout our, uh, our passage here, we see that we abide in him, verse 13, because he has given us of his spirit. The word of his spirit is out of his spirit. It's the word ek. You see the word exit, out of or from? He's like... You have the Holy Spirit and your life, your testimony flows out of a relationship with God. And it shows, if you would. Now, uh, by way of illustration, when you go to the airport, what's the first thing you do when you go to the airport? 
you check in. Why do we check in? To confirm your flight, right? To confirm that you are actually getting on this plane and you're going to fly out. Otherwise, you're going to miss the plane. The Holy Spirit has been given to confirm, if you would, your salvation. And the fruits of the Spirit flow out of that. Galatians 5, you could see that passage. We see that the moment someone is saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we rest in the fact that we have assurance of salvation because of the confirmation of the Holy Spirit in our life and what He's done. God's Spirit is a gift to His children. Go back to chapter 3, verse 24. 324. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. You see, the Holy Spirit's a promise to every true believer. And in Gen or Ephesians 1, we're told that he's the guarantor, he is the seal that is there on your salvation until Jesus comes back, until the rapture, he's like, I am, if you would, I'm the watchman of your salvation. I'm the guarantor, the seal. No one can undo that. And he's given him to every one of us that know Jesus as Savior. That's encouraging. And we know, as we've already gone through 1 John, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So why do we get so scared in this world? Because in those moments, we're abiding with the world more than we're abiding with Jesus. And we have to say, Lord, help me to remember the truth about God, about your spirit, more than the hostilities, the confusion of the world that I live in. Well, uh, as we look at that, God's perfecting love confirms the presence of the Holy Spirit. It confirms the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then B, God's perfecting love confirms a life transformed by a saving profession in Christ. A saving profession in Christ. Verse 14, we see we, that's the apostolic witness, is the word beheld. And John's like, I remember gazing at Jesus. I remember Thomas in that moment when he, Jesus said, hey, thrust your hand into my side, into my hand. See, handle me and see. For a spirit does not have a body as you see I have. And so as he shared that, John vividly is saying, boy, I remember what it was like to see Jesus. I testified this was really real. Well, um, we look in verse 14, we see that we have the guarantee of that, uh, that testimony from the apostles. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God resides or abides in him. Now, confesses. Now, don't get in your head this little confessional booth. What does it mean to confess? It means to say the same thing, to agree with. When I say we sing a song or I preach a point, I know we're not like a real loud amen and a rowdy type church, but uh, we do amen every now and then. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you amen, do you know what you're saying? I agree. I agree. Amen. So be it. Let it be. And, and if you would, I concur. And if you would, everybody that knows Jesus, every time you hear that Jesus died and rose again, you say, amen, I concur. I agree with that. I need that. Now, if you come away and you hear, man, those guys are just a little too Jesus freaky, okay? They just love the cross and the death of Jesus, and that's they talk about that a little too much. You're probably not saved. You probably don't know God. You're probably on the way to hell away from him for eternity. Because the Christian says every time we proclaim his death till it comes, like we said at the end of the communion, you're like, yeah, if you would. It's like the Christian says, this is the end zone. Jesus is winning. He's got us through. We are in. And the believer is totally anchored into Christ. In the fact that we confess the full deity of Christ. Now, the false teachers don't confess the full deity or humanity of Christ. 
And there's a lot of false teachers as we've studied through the book that said, ah, we don't, not so on that. They'll say that Jesus was the brother of Lucifer or he once was an archangel or he was a spirit baby from God. Weird, weird stuff. A lot of cults pipe up a lot of stuff. If it's not in the Bible, we don't agree with it. Jesus is the eternal son of God who came in time with, to take on humanity for us at the right time, at the appointed time, in the fullness of times. Well, today, I want us to consider this. Are you loving in such a way to make God visible to the lost and the unsaved? Does your life evidence the Holy Spirit conviction about who Christ is? Are you teachable about Jesus? Agreeable with the Holy Spirit about the things of God? Those things are essential here for us to be walking in, to be believing in. Three, we want us to consider this. That uh, maturing in God's love prepares you to have godly confidence for the judgment seat of Christ. Now, some of you are like, I don't know what the judgment seat of Christ is. There's two judgments coming. One for the saved. That's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's also called the Bema seat. That's the Greek word. It was used of in the Isthmian Games or the Olympic Games with a raised platform. And, the, and if you would, the refs, the judges would look down and they say, that guy crossed the line first. He gets, if you would, they'd have a little garland that they put on his head and he might win the prize of whatever sort it was. If you would, we finish the race. When we kept the face, faith, we have finished the course. And we cross that line. When one day we get to heaven, we've completed our works, serving the Lord, loving him. But the day comes at the rapture when everyone will be glorified and we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You can write down 2 Corinthians 5.10 that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We also see in Romans 14, verse 10 as well, that we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and so we look in verse 17. Uh, love has been, or love is perfected among us in this, that we have boldness. The word boldness is confidence, openness, assurance in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. The word confidence, you know, so... This isn't you, but maybe someone else. You get a speeding ticket, and the police officer pulls you over. And the officer says, did you see the speed limit? And you either say yes or no. Always speak the truth. But maybe you're thinking in your head, I saw the speed limit, but I didn't see you. And you start to shrink back. Do you talk much with the officer when you get in trouble? You're usually ashamed. And you know what? What does it say with God? If you love like Jesus loves, you will not be ashamed at his coming. You're not going to shrink back. You're going to have boldness before him. And we look to the Lord and we're like, Lord, how can I have boldness before you? I've got to really believe that all of my sins, every single one of them is forgiven. That your love is fixed. Did you know that God can, will not love you any more than he loves you now? He will never love you less than he does now. God's love is constant. It's not performance-based, amen? It's based on who he is. God is love. Fundamental to who he is. God is a constant. He loves you. He loves me. And it's it's not going to change, regardless of what you do. Now, will it break fellowship if we live in sin? Yes. Will it terminate our relationship? Uh, here's his birth certificate. I'm handing this one over. Um, is God ditching us? No. He doesn't hand you over to the neighbor and say, you take him from here on out. No, he's like, You're, I love you. You're permanently mine. And when you know 
my love and live it out in your own life, you're going to have even more confidence and boldness before me. Now, confidence is a matter of assurance. I have to believe the right things to do the right things. Bad theology leads to bad behavior. So if I'm not trusting God, I'm going to wimp out on him. I'm going to shrink back. I'm going to cower. God's like, you've got to have courage by believing me more than your feelings. Unlike what the world tells us, do not follow your heart. Follow Jesus. All right? So we, we want to anchor into him and not this world's mantras of hopelessness. You know, as we come before him, we will have boldness in that day, in his revealing, the day of judgment, the Bama seat, when there will be rewards given out. If you want to learn more about that, we'll be studying that in Sunday school very soon about the judgment seat of Christ and the different rewards that are given out to believers and how we can faithfully serve him more um, in this day and age. You know, it says in verse 17, does it say as he is, so we ought to be in this world? No, it says as he is, as God is, so are we. That's, that's good news. His character should be lived out. He's the grounds of our boldness that we are able to approach. It's not my performance. It's him. And living for him just matches that. And it gives us encouragement that we would not be uh, wrapped up in all the fears of this world. You know, America is tied up in a ton of fears. David Jeremiah shared an illustration. Journalist Bob Garfield tracked health articles, found that according to the experts, 59 million Americans have heart disease, 53 million suffer migraines, 25 million have osteoporosis, 16 million struggle with obesity, 3 million have cancer, 12 million have severe disorders such as brain injuries, etc. The results were all added up together, 543 million Americans who are seriously sick. That's especially shocking because at the time that this was done, America was only 286 million in population. He's like, some people, either as a society we're doomed or somebody is seriously double dipping. Um, end of quote. You know, we live in a society that is cursed, anxious, worked up. If you're worked up, you're not loving like Jesus wants you to love. If you're living in despair, you're going to the wrong address with your problems. You need to come to Christ. I love a, a, a poem years ago. So near, so very near to God, I could not nearer be. For in the person of his son, I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God, dearer I could not be. The love wherewith he loved his son, such is his love for me. Thank you, Lord, that you love me like that, with that degree of richness. You know... We need to have a, the fear of the Lord where we respect him, we defer to him, and not fear this world. Today, a living God's perfecting love grows our confidence in knowing and trusting God, verse 16. In knowing and trusting God. B, reflecting God's character will grow undeterred, Christ-centered confidence, verse 17. He's like, you may have boldness, assurance in the day of judgment, verse 17. Here he gives us really good news that we would have confidence, openness before him. I have a lot of verses here. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or the word bad is worthless, of no consequence. Romans 14.10, we see that one day every knee shall bow. Um, everyone will give an account of himself to God. And he tells us that we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Also, Colossians 1.21-22 
We were once alienated and enemies by our, all of our sins, yet now he's reconciled us in the body of his flesh through the, the death of Jesus, through his death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Do you know how Jesus sees you if you're saved? Holy and blameless and above reproach. How sweet is God? He's like, I'm, I'm going to take care of all those sins because you can't do it, but I can. And we trust him for that. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 15, or 3.15 tells us that our works will be reviewed and our works will be burned. They will suffer loss, but we ourselves, we're going to be saved, yet so is through fire. We don't lose our salvation, but some of our good works weren't so good. <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm sorry, that one was uh, kittling wood. That was a bonfire. There wasn't too much Jesus in it. Well, think of uh, C. True selfless love for others best frees you from fears, terrors. Verse 18. Verse 18, we see, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It drives it away. The net translation has it. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You know, with this, God's like, you need to rest in me a whole lot more than all the anxieties of this world. I uh, want to tie that up. I think we will pick up the last uh, couple verses next week. And I'm going to even recap a little on this fear topic because... In Realville, this is a problem we often run into. So we're going to touch more on this. We don't have really good reasons to worry. We think we do. But perfect love casts out fear. Hold on to that verse. Memorize it. Know it. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. And we need to just rest in who he is more than our circumstances. Let's pray. Lord God. Would you please help us to be abiding in you, for you are worthy. Help us to trust you and not live just by the seat of our pants, just, walk, just running like crazy in this world. Satan would love us to be busy, to be self-absorbed. Lord, help us to be proactive. Help us to be selfless and sacrificial. For you are worthy. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.